All right, the title of my talk for this evening is Paving the Way with gauss Bonnet: An Invitation to Curvature and Topology. I'll begin with a PDF uh, explaining some of the most uh, important points, but then I will uh, change over to my iPad in order to be able to uh, describe some of the uh, proofs for you and so forth. I would like to first begin with the uh, notion of the genus of a compact oriented surface. So, um, <clears throat> The definition, uh, or a possible definition of the genus, is it's the maximum number of disjoint closed curves that you can draw on a surface that does not disconnect the surface. So for these purposes, I'm going to concentrate on uh, closed surfaces, compact surfaces without a boundary. So here uh, I've drawn what's called a surface of genus two, it looks like uh, a donut with two holes. And uh, the sense in which it has genus two is that you can draw two closed curves on the surface such that if you cut them out, uh, it does not disconnect the surface. Uh, so it, you, if you might try you know, drawing some other closed curves, if you, draw, if you were to draw a closed curve spotlight here. If you were to uh, draw a closed curve uh, around here, then it would cut the surface into two pieces. Or if you were to draw another uh, closed curve parallel to the one that uh, here I've, I've drawn something that, that loops through one of the holes, you could move that curve over a little bit. If you were to cut there, then uh, you would have separated off a piece of the surface. You'd have a piece that looked like a cylinder. Uh, another, if you, you might try to draw a closed curve on this surface, uh, that's a kind of mirror image of the one I've drawn here, but that would cross uh, this first curve. And one of the requirements is that um, th these, th these closed curves or circles should all be disjoint from each other. No two should meet. It, so <laughs> it actually is an interesting thing that there, there really is a maximum number of, of uh, of circles that you can draw without uh, disconnecting some piece of the uh, of the surface. Maybe I should have drawn the simplest case. Um, if we had if we had drawn uh, the the surface of a sphere instead, uh, if I had drawn a, the surface of a sphere, then uh, on the surface of a sphere, um, the uh, uh, you know if you draw a closed curve on the sphere on the surface, it's going to cut off a, a, a little disc. Um, and uh, it, it's not, it, it seems plausible, but I mean, that's actually a, a non-trivial piece of mathematics to show that uh, there is no circle on the, uh, on the surface of a two-dimensional sphere, uh, which doesn't uh, disconnect it. Um, so, uh, in the same way, the surface of genus two, you can draw uh, two circles that um, uh, don't disconnect the surface. Um, but on the other hand, the uh, uh, you can't draw more. And actually, uh, this simple idea, there's a lot of interesting algebraic topology hidden behind this, because it really has to do with um, you can define what's called the first uh, homology of uh, first cohomology of, of the surface. And uh, you could then ask for you know the, the dimension of a linear subspace of the, uh, of the first cohomology on which uh, whenever you take the, if you think of these as rep represented as uh, let's say if you do this in Durham cohomology, this would be, Durham classes of closed one forms. What's the maximum uh, dimension of space such that whenever you take the um, the wedge product of the two of these one forms, you get something which is zero in which has integral zero on the surface. 
So it turns out that for a surface of genus two, the maximum size of such a subspace is dimension two. Uh, so the uh, <coughs> so the there's a nice geometric interpretation of genus uh, described in this way, but it and you can certainly see that abstractly it must be uh, well defined. It takes a little more work to see uh, to actually prove rigorously that, for example. By this definition, this is a surface of genus two. Well, um, <clears throat> let me now uh, just get my spotlight and I'll try to go on. So for th this is, uh, in this example, um, one has the, uh, the genus is uh, two for this particular surface. And there is a, very interesting, uh, slightly non-obvious uh, invariant of a surface that, so here it's a, it's a connected uh, compact surface without boundary. Its Euler characteristic is the number two minus twice the genus. So for example, for the two sphere, for the two, two, for the two sphere, uh, that number would be two because the genus is zero. Uh, whereas for a surface of genus two, the answer would turn out to be minus two, right? So, um, <clears throat> so this is a number which has some kind of topological significance. There is a, an invariant notion of genus, uh, which you, asking how many circles can I draw on the surface without disconnecting it? disjoint circles. Uh, I, from that, I can cook up an invariant called the Euler characteristic. Euler described this initially in a very different way. I'll mention something of, about that later. Uh, but obviously, uh, if you know the, the genus, you know the Euler characteristic. If you know the Euler characteristic, you know the genus. So they sort of determine each other and uh, one very non-trivial fact is that if uh, you can show that two oriented surfaces, or oriented means it has, an, there's a difference between the outside and the inside. You can make a consistent choice of, if you like, uh, if, you, if this is embedded in, in, um, in three-dimensional space, it's saying that you can decide which side you would consistently draw a normal vector on. Such things that can, uh, it turns out that every compact oriented surface can be embedded in three space. And the most general thing is a donut with G holes where G is the, where script G is the genus. So the, here I've drawn a, a donut with two holes. The genus is in fact two. You could also, um, you could also uh, describe the, you know, a, a, if you, if you take a, a donut with the uh, with k holes in it would have genus k. And it's a, a, a rather interesting uh, theorem in the theory of uh, surfaces, alias two manifolds, two dimensional manifolds, um, that uh, that the compact oriented ones are in fact just generalizations uh, of this picture where you have simply added on more and more pieces that look like a, a torus. Now, <clears throat> that has not, that's, a, that's a discussion that has to do with topology. Uh, it has nothing to do with the geometry of how surfaces sit in three space, or there's, an, uh, there's a, a more important, deeper notion of uh, the intrinsic geometry of a manifold. If you have, uh, if you were to say, well, let's just think about this surface intrinsically, it's something which locally looks like R2, and we can uh, think of it as, as glued together by, as just a bunch of open sets in R2 that are consistently glued together in some way. When it sits in R3, there is a, any, any smooth curve you draw on the surface will become a smooth curve in R3, and you then have a notion of, well, what's the length of such a curve? To calculate lengths of curves really depends on, uh, well, 
what is distance? You say it's the integral of speed. To be able to calculate the speed of a curve, what you really need to be able to do is if you parameterize the curve, what is the length of its velocity vector? So if you can measure the length of vectors on a manifold, you can start assigning lengths to curves and then try to come up with a notion of distance, intrinsic distance. Uh, that topic is uh, called Riemannian geometry and the ancestor of it was initiated in the early 19th century by Gauss. Gauss actually, uh, he eventually became a, a very distinguished uh, professor of mathematics, world famous scientist who's famous for, uh, as an astronomer, a, a physicist, as well as uh, a, as a mathematician. But he, uh, he actually started off with a very concrete question. He had a job as a bureaucrat for one of the small princely states that made up Germany at the time. And he was assigned the task of creating a map of this kingdom where the distances on the map were all perfectly accurate. So that if you just spread out this map of the kingdom and you measured with a ruler how far apart two, two cities were, you would be able to deduce the, you know, to the accuracy of, the, of how well the map was drawn, this would be a kind of perfect representation of distances. What Gauss discovered was that actually this was impossible for, uh, for any region on a genuinely curved surface, he discovered. Uh, you can't make a, a planar map which captures the uh, distances between points accurately. And the, I, the particular thing that uh, led him to this discovery was he started thinking about what we now call the Gauss map. So suppose you have uh, a surface, maybe not compact. Uh, I'll draw some pictures where it's not compact. It might have uh, a boundary or it might not be compact. Um, but suppose that it's embedded in, in R3. So a typical case, think about the globe, think about you know, your standard sphere sitting in R3. And in fact, uh, Gauss realized there was an interesting way of relating uh, an ordinary, you know, any embedded surface to the two sphere. There was a, there's a natural map that you can define from the surface to the two sphere. And the way that you define this is that each point you, you have an, if you have an orientation, you know which side is thought of as out or up. And at that point, you draw a unit vector that's perpendicular to the surface. That's a unit vector, but you could then transport it over to the origin and think of it as a point in the unit, in the unit uh, two sphere. So if this is our surface M, then at this point, um, provided I've drawn the scale correctly, suppose this is a, a unit vector, then you could also think of that vector in the way that you're taught in uh, kind of naively thinking about vectors in most undergraduate courses, you would think of a vector as an, as an oriented, uh, as, as, a, as an arrow with a specific length and direction at any point in let's say Euclidean three space. And then you could always say, well, I can think of vectors at different points. I could think of the set, this vector as being equivalent to one that's at the origin and then has unit length. So that defines a point in the unit, uh, unit sphere in R3, which is called S2. The, the, the reason it's called S2 is the, the two is its intrinsic dimension. It is a two dimensional surface or two manifold. All right, so as you change point, as you go from point to point on this surface, uh, the unit vector uh, points in different directions. And so this gives you a map from your surface to the two sphere. And this is called the Gauss map. Um, it seems like a, a, a kind of an obvious thing to do, but what Gauss discovered by studying this Gauss map is remarkable. Namely, um, remember that uh, the 
the tangent space of the two sphere at any unit vector is the is exactly the plane perpendicular to that unit vector. And we're sending the unit normal of, uh, of M to uh, a unit vector on the two sphere, which means that the tangent space uh, of, uh, our, of our surface at any point P is parallel to the plane, uh, to the tangent plane of the sphere at its image. So the tangent the, the tangent plane of the surface here is a parallel is a two plane parallel to the uh, uh, to the uh, tangent space of the sphere at its image, and in just as we thought of vectors at different points as being uh, you know if you can move a vector parallel to itself to the origin you get you think of it as the same uh, as the same vector well this may, means that you can think of the tangent space of the surface at a point P as being the same as the tangent uh, space of the sphere at the image of P under the Gauss map. So you can think of this, uh, if you take the derivative of the Gauss map, you can think of it as a map from the tangent space of uh, M to itself. Whenever you have a linear map from a vector space to itself, then without making any further choices, there is a well-defined no, well notion of its determinant. And the Gauss curvature of a surface as originally discovered by Gauss, um, his definition amounts to saying that what he calls the curvature capital K is it's the determinant of the derivative of the Gauss map. Now, this is uh, not the simplest way of trying to understand what the Gauss curvature looks like. It's often described as the, as the uh, product of two principal curvatures. So if we look at how the, uh, <laughs> if we look at uh, the way that uh, the, this Gauss map uh, acts, this map from the uh, from the uh, and th this this map from the tangent space of M to itself. Here you think of so you, here you're you're mapping the manifold to the two sphere. If you take the derivative of that map, then you get something which can be thought of as a map from the tangent space to itself, and it has two eigenvectors. Uh, and the eigenvalues could be are often called the principal curvatures k1 and k2. And if you have a map from R2 to R2, its determinant is the product, and it's, it's diagonalizable. So it can be. Uh, this is a diagonalizable map. In fact, it's uh, it, it's it's represented by a symmetric matrix in any basis in any orthogonal basis. So it, you can diagonalize this, and it's uh, often the Gauss curvature is written as the product of the two principal curvatures. But the geometry here is that, well, if, if you have a curve in the plane, its curvature, its, its extrinsic curvature, is uh, you think of it as being approximated by a circle, and its curva the curvature of a curve in the plane is 1 over the radius of that circle. So if the radius is very small, it's very curved, right? So uh, if, the, if, the, if a curve, if a circle of radius R in the plane has curvature one over R. It turns out that uh, this, uh, you can find two directions of, uh, of maximum or minimum and minimum uh, curvature if you look at, at slices of this surface by planes perpendicular to it. And then those, the, cur the, the curvatures of those two curves in the plane, so two plane sections, would be called these principal curvatures and the, uh, and, and the product of those two is the Gauss curvature. In the particular example I've illustrated here, one of the uh, principal curvatures is negative and the other is positive. They have different signs that's reflected by the fact that the, the surface is saddle shaped, it's bending in two different directions. So if you look at the derivative of this map from, uh, from 
uh, the surface to the, the two sphere, it actually turns out to be orientation reversing near the point that uh, I've been discussing. So this is actually, uh, this is a surface where in this region, the Gauss curvature is negative. But Gauss discovered something very surprising. In fact, it was so surprising, he, in his Latin manuscript, he, the people tended to uh, publish their math papers in Latin in those days, uh, under the assumption that if, for example, uh, who would read German uh, other than a German, and Gauss wanted his, uh, his papers read all over the world, so he published in Latin. Uh, what he uh, uh, discovered is that actually the Gauss curvature does not depend on the way the surface is, uh, it, it does not directly depend on the way the surface is embedded in uh, R3, it actually is completely determined if you simply know how to measure lengths of curves on, um, on the surface. So actually what's going on, uh, Gauss's proof of this was rather indirect, but uh, Bonnet, uh, whose name came up in the title of, the, uh, of this talk, uh, discovered a, uh, a simpler way of describing what's going on. Let's just take the example of, suppose our surface is the round unit sphere. All right, so on the round unit sphere, the Gauss map, what is the Gauss map for the round unit sphere? Uh, if any, <laughs> at any point on the sphere, the outward pointed vector just points like the vector in the same direction as the vector from the origin. On this object, the Gauss map is the identity, and therefore the derivative of, of the Gauss map is the identity, and it has determinant one. A unit sphere has Gauss curvature identically equal to one. Gauss, uh, and if you think about what I just told you about principal curvatures a moment ago, or you could look directly from the definition that I gave in terms of the derivative of the Gauss map, the, uh, <clears throat> the principal curvatures uh, of the unit uh, sphere are both are one at any point. So you find that the, the, the Gauss curvature is one squared equals one. If it was instead a, uh, if it was a sphere of radius rho rather than of radius one, you would find that the, the Gauss curvature was one over rho squared. All right, but let's just concentrate on the unit sphere. And here, I mean, if, if, if Gauss's original problem that was set by the ruler of this little kingdom was uh, make him a map of his kingdom which wouldn't distort lengths at all. Well, uh, let's just suppose that um, the, uh, the kingdom was uh, rather bigger than not just some little region in, in, uh, in, in Germany. Let's say it, it, was, it was a circular uh, region on the, on the sphere around the North Pole, going from the North Pole to some line <coughs> of latitude. Now, it, so if you just, Here's the thing about the geometry of the sphere. If you take, you could say, well, what do I mean by the distance on the sphere from the North Pole to any other point? Uh, I'd be asking, what's the shortest path on, the, uh, on the, the sphere without leaving the sphere? If I take the shortest path, it has, happens to be a great circle on the sphere. And so the, the uh, so in fact, uh, the, radius intrinsic to the sphere, the distance from P to the boundary of this disk would actually just be the angle, if this was the unit sphere, this would be the angle uh, that's subtended by this arc from, seen from the origin. Well, that's fine, but you know in Euclidean space, the length of, if you take, if you draw, start at a point in Euclidean space, you, you look at the region you can get by curves of, of length less than r, that's a, a round disk and its radius is r. What's the circumference of the boundary of that disk? Well, you all know in Euclidean space, that's two pi r. However, 
you want, might also notice that on the sphere, this, uh, this is not, if you're, if you're looking at it as in Euclidean three space, space, then you'd say, well, this circle, it doesn't have Euclidean radius R because you get it by slicing, uh, you get it by slicing uh, this, But you get it by 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 slicing the the sphere with a plane, and uh, in that plane, what is the radius of uh, of this circle? So in that in the horizontal plane, its radius is not r; it's the sine of r. And you would find, therefore, that the length of that circle it's not if r is the distance in the two sphere, the radius as measured without leaving the, the, the two sphere, this is what you get as the boundary is a Euclidean circle of radius sine r. And so it's circumference is shorter. It's circumference is actually two pi times the sine of r. So in fact, uh, there's, a, the, there's an intrinsic description. Sorry, I have to. <clears throat> trying to get back to uh, where I can, oh, there we, there we go. So <clears throat> if you take in any surface, you say, well, let's look at the disk of radius R around a point, meaning uh, look at all points you can get to by curves in the surface, of, of arc length no more than r. Then take the boundary of that region and that will be some, if, it's, if r is sufficiently small, this turns out to always be a topological circle and a smooth one if r is small enough. And you could take its, its circumference and divide by the Euclidean answer, which is two pi r. So, if we were in Euclidean space, the quotient would be one, but it turns out that for small values of R in a general surface, what you find out is that the Taylor series for this function of R, it's, it's one, it has zeroth order term one, it has no first order term, it has a quadratic term, and the, the coefficient of that uh, quadratic term is the Gauss curvature times minus a sixth. So here on the unit sphere, uh, <clears throat> on the unit sphere where the Gauss curvature was one, uh, what, this, what this power series looks like is the power series for sine r over r. And, uh, and if you think about it, that would be one minus r squared over six plus higher order terms, uh, terms of order r to the fourth. All right, so if you were to, uh, if you like, this turns out to have a perfectly well-defined second derivative at r equals zero, and that second derivative uh, is a constant times the Gauss curvature. All right, so uh, this is an illustration of, uh, of, of uh, this principle called the uh, Theorema Egregium uh, discovered by uh, Gauss. Uh, mean that where that name means remarkable theorem. He sort of thought of it as the most important result in his book. The, so if you take a little piece of the of the round sphere, there are other ways of embedding that in uh, Euclidean space, which are not part of a globe. You can. It turns out that without distorting distance. Let me just take a, a simpler example. Look at this piece of paper. It looks like a piece of the plane. Um, this paper can be, it has Gauss curvature zero. If, uh, if you were to think about it as being embedded in uh, R3 as a plane. But I could roll up this paper a little bit. And you see that there are other ways of embedding the, the, the piece of paper. I've not changed the length of any curve on the, uh, on the the page. If I were to say that uh, when I'm defining the length of the curve, 
I draw some curve on the surface, it has the same length before and after I bend the paper. But this way, it's pretty clear that it has Gauss curvature zero. When I roll it up, it still has Gauss curvature zero. I haven't changed the notion of length in the page. In fact, when you look at the, the derivative of the Gauss map, it turns out the Gauss map, when, when you roll up, if you're just thinking of it as, as a simple example, suppose I rolled it into a perfect cylinder. Then this Gauss map that assigns to each point on the paper, the outward point normal, would it would vary in the circles going this way, but on the straight lines in the opposite direction, the Gauss map is actually constant. In this case, there, there, at each point, there is a principal curvature equal to zero. There's also another principal curvature that's not, not zero that would be one over the radius of the circle I rolled it up into to make a tube. But the point is the Gauss curvature is the product of those two principal curvatures. If one of them is zero, the Gauss curvature is zero. Now, the fact that you can bend a paper without changing length on it is uh, obvious enough. Uh, in fact, this is a very, very common phenomenon. Uh, there are lots of surfaces that can be, they can be deformed in, uh, in three space without changing the, the, the intrinsic notion of lengths of curves. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting to, uh, uh, to construct such examples. All right, so I began the, the lecture by talking about something about the topology of surfaces. I talked about an invariant called the genus of a surface, and there was a, uh, a, there was a related invariant called the Euler characteristic. On the other hand, now I've been talking about the Gauss curvature of a, a surface, which is not a topological invariant. It has to do with the, it has to do with the uh, particular way that it, it turns out it, it, it's related to the so-called Riemannian geometry of the surface. We've in, introduced a, a notion of how do you measure the lengths of curves. And when you do that, uh, then there is an association, uh, associated notion of Gauss curvature. Well, the, cal the classical gauss binet theorem is a relationship between the Euler characteristic of a, sur of a compact surface without boundary and the Gauss curvature. So um, it tells you that the integral of the Gauss curvature against intrinsic area is just two pi times the Euler characteristic. And surprisingly enough, in particular, the integral of the Gauss curvature on a compact surface without boundary is always two pi times an integer, namely the Euler characteristic. To give you a, a, a sense, though, that this is saying something remarkable about uh, the relationship between geometry and curvature, let's look at uh, this example of a surface. Uh, this is a surface of genus three. Its Euler characteristic is minus four. If you, uh, if you, now uh, ask, can I find a Riemannian metric? Is there some way of, maybe not by uh, embedding this in three-dimensional space, I could imagine instead I embed it in 50-dimensional space, there'd still be a, uh, a way of uh, measuring the lengths of curves. And that would give rise to an intrinsic, so-called Riemannian metric that you'd have an intrinsic, uh, you would have imposed some uh, notion of what's the length of a, of a tangent vector, with, uh, which is not too different uh, locally from uh, the Euclidean notion. At each, at each point, you're getting a, an inner product on the tangent space that uh, varies smoothly from uh, point to point. That's called a Riemannian metric. 
can I find a Riemannian metric on this surface where the curvature is, for example, plus one? We just saw the two sphere, the standard unit two sphere has Gauss curvature one. Can I find a Gauss curvature one metric on this surface? Or could I just find a Gauss curvature, uh, could I find a Riemannian metric on the surface where the Gauss curvature was everywhere positive? Well, the answer is no, because the Euler characteristic of this surface is negative. That means that the integral of the Gauss curvature is negative. And so the average value of the, uh, of, of the Gauss curvature turns out to be necessarily negative. By the way, if you, if you embed this surface in, in three space in the way I've drawn, it, there are regions like the one I'm indicating right here where the Gauss curvature is positive. It's, it's positive here, it's positive there, but it's negative in a lot more places. The average value of the Gauss curvature uh, is necessarily negative. All right, so uh, this is the beginning of a huge uh, area of uh, mathematical research, which is uh, the relationship between curvature and topology for Riemannian manifolds. Now, in the case of a surface, Curvature is a fairly simple uh, object. It turns out it's, it's completely determined intrinsically by the, um, by the Riemannian metric, the me way you measure the lengths of tangent vectors. So, this so you can choose on any manifold, there are Riemannian metrics, any Riemannian metric has curvature. There's an intrinsic notion of curvature. But, um, in dimension two, the curvature is equivalent to just this function called the Gauss curvature. In higher dimensions, the curvature uh, is no longer a, a scalar quantity. It is a tensor called the curvature tensor. And there is a generalization of this theorem. If you take uh, an even dimensional manifold of dimension 2n, there is a certain quantity that you can write down called the Gauss-Binet integrand in terms of uh, its curvature tensor at any point. Uh, this is ex expression is also known as the Fothian of the curvature. And uh, if you integrate that expression, you get the Euler characteristic of the manifold. For, uh, for dimensions that are multiples of four, there are other similar kinds of, uh, of invariants, topological invariants, uh, slightly less familiar than the Euler characteristic. I'll say more about the Euler characteristic in a moment when I uh, pass over to my, uh, to my iPad. But the, uh, the thing to be uh, emphasized here is that um, there are topological uh, invariants of manifolds which uh, can be expressed in terms of doing some kind of curvature integral. On the other hand, the, uh, the Gauss-Binet theorem in dimension two, it tells you just uh, so much about the uh, possible geometries on two manifolds. These higher dimensional analogs, they're interesting, but they're not so powerful. And in fact, uh, in order to study the Riemannian geometry of higher dimensional manifolds and to find relations between topology and curvature, one needs completely different techniques. Uh, so while I've, uh, so it's, if you find this subject interesting, it's extremely uh, worth your time spending some time learning about the Gauss-Binet theorem. But when you actually do, uh, when you study the analogous problems in higher dimensions, then, uh, th then it turns out one needs very different techniques. So I will now uh, uh, share my iPad where I didn't have a to uh, enough time to uh, make up the kinds of detailed slides I would really like for a talk like this. I could only make, uh, put together a, a few pictures, and now I'll uh, change over to my my 
iPad and tell you some more things related to curvature and topology. Oh, have I missed anything on the chat? Uh, someone asked, uh, why would you expect it to be diagonalizable? The derivative of the Gauss map, it turns out that it is represented by a symmetric form on the tangent space called the second fundamental form. So in fact, in any, uh, in any uh, or orthonormal basis for the tangent space, it's actually represented by a symmetric matrix. Any symmetric matrix is diagonalizable. And was there another question? Okay, so um, let me now share my pad. Some reason I'm having a hard time getting my pad to communicate with the, the Zoom. Let's try this. Finally. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let me give you um, a few uh, uh, hints about what happens for Gauss Binet on surfaces. So if we look at just, let's look at just the uh, two dimensional Gauss Binet theorem. First of all, it involved this quantity called the Euler characteristic of our surface. And it's worth uh, uh, saying a little bit about this. More generally, you could talk about the Euler characteristic of a manifold of uh, any dimension, just as long as, let's, for example, it's compact, maybe with boundary. The uh, Euler characteristic was originally discovered by uh, Euler, as this might uh, name it might indicate, although what Euler did was quite modest. Uh, Euler simply uh, looked at uh, convex, uh, <laughs> convex polyhedra, and in particular, you might look at something like, you might look for starters at the platonic solids. <laughs> so next one would be the dodecahedron, which is a little bit harder to draw. Da, 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 da. I've sort of indicated that there's a dodecahedron. But in fact, it does not have to be a, a regular uh, uh, polyhedron. Just take some convex polyhedron. So it, it take a region in, uh, in three space, which is convex, and which uh, has uh, a boundary which consists of a finite number of flat faces. Uh, so uh, Euler imagined you had something which where you could uh, break down the number of uh, you could break down the uh, uh, the the boundary into uh, a union of triangles, and uh, then the Euler characteristic would be the uh, <clears throat> the number of faces. In fact, they don't even have to be all triangles; they could be. Uh, they could be poly polygons of different shapes, uh, minus the number of edges, plus the number of vertices. And what uh, Euler discovered, first looking at the regular uh, polyhedras for, for a convex polyhedron, uh, this Euler characteristic is always two. And what's going on here is that uh, the, <clears throat> for convex polyhedron, and here we're talking about the boundary, the, the convex polyhedron is in fact homeomorphic to the two sphere. We said before that the two sphere has Euler characteristic two. And this was the original way that it was defined. You take a triangulation of your surface so you 
it's, it's not obvious, but it's true. Every surface can be broken up as a union of, for example, triangles. You could, you could first break it up into uh, polygons of, of uh, different shapes, but then those can always be subdivided into triangles. It turns out that this, when you subdivide, you don't change. Uh, the, the change in the, in the faces minus the edges plus the vertices always cancels, right? So you, you, you don't change this Euler characteristic by subdivision. So if I were to replace one of these triangles with uh, a bunch of other tri smaller triangles, then what you could do is, is check that, uh, that the, con the net contribution you get from the original triangle is the same as the net contribution you would get from the subdivision. Um, the, uh, so I, the way I described it was rather different. I assumed that we had a compact surface without boundary, and then we uh, asked how many circles could we draw on it without, uh, without disconnecting the surface that was called the genus. And uh, it, it's a remarkable fact that the Euler characteristic is the same as two minus twice the genus. This is for a two manifold. Um, there is a Another description, if you, for those of you, some people in the audience already know about Durham cohomology, and so I will uh, indicate that really what the, the intrinsic, if you know about uh, uh, something like Durham cohomology, then uh, the Euler characteristic is the alternating sum of the Betty numbers of the manifold, where Bj is the dimension of the nth uh, of, of the jth of the jth cohomology of M. All right, so where this could be, the, for example, the jth Durham cohomology. So what's really going on here is that uh, this, this, the two here is B0 plus B2, those are both one. And then uh, the twice the genus turns out to be the same as the first Betty number. All right, so there are several different uh, ways of understanding this Euler characteristic, um, but a uh, perhaps a, a, a more fascinating uh, aspect of it is that it has the property that if you have a space, here you could do this uh, for rather general compact uh, topological spaces. Suppose that uh, your space is written as uh, a union of two uh, compact subsets, and uh, then you have, uh, and, and they overlap. So there is some, you know, might not, and then there's some overlap, A intersect B. So um, then it would turn out that the Euler characteristic of the union is the same as the Euler characteristic, the sum of the Euler characteristics of these two pieces minus the Euler characteristic of the overlap. And uh, so one using Durham cohomology, you could prove that uh, this property is true. And then to get back to Euler's kind of definition, you could say, well, what does this mean about if we divide our surface up into uh, regions, which are, for example, neighborhoods of, uh, of uh, edges, neighborhoods of uh, the interiors of faces, and maybe neighborhoods of vertices. By taking a covering like that, uh, and then where all of the uh, overlaps are actually contractible, they all have Euler characteristic one. And you, you can then build up and find out uh, a very nice that <clears throat> could prove that the Durham cohomology definition of uh, of, uh, of the Euler characteristic in terms of Betty numbers it has this property, and then therefore it can it has the if you if you triangulate your manifold. Uh, you will get something which is the alternating sum. In the two-dimensional cases, you would just have faces, edges, vertices, but in higher dimensions, you would take an alternating sum. If it was a three-manifold, you would you would give uh, a negative contribution for the uh, for the uh, so you know the vertices always get a positive sign, edges get negative sign. Uh, the two-dimensional pieces get get uh, two-dimensional faces get uh, 
positive signs, a three-dimensional face gets a negative sign and so forth. So you take the alternating sum of the, uh, of the number of faces in each dimension, generalizing this uh, original formula. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so how does one prove uh, something like, uh, like Gauss-Bonnet? So there are several different proofs. Uh, so uh, one proof, would go in the following way. The lemma would be that uh, the uh, integral of the Gauss curvature against area on a compact uh, manifold M, here this is a M to a closed surface, so this is compact without boundary. Um, what you can show is that this uh, is unchanged by changing the Riemannian metric. So um, uh, what one actually shows is that um, if you were to, so it, it's, uh, let's, let's assume that M is uh, oriented. It turns out that the Gauss-Bonnet theorem is true even from an unoriented surface, uh, as long as it's compact without boundary. The reason is it, though that every surface has a, a double cover which is oriented. And then uh, th this expression and the Euler characteristic are both multiplicative under covers. If uh, M is oriented, uh, then we could actually write this integral in the form, uh, let's say, k times a two-form omega, where this is the area form. And uh, if you were to, uh, you could hear this uh, expression is attached to a particular metric. If you have a one-parameter family of metrics, then you could ask, Um, uh, you could uh, ask, what is the uh, what is the derivative of this expression? This is a two form on a on a uh, on a surface, and uh, if you like Stokes' theorem or Green's theorem, uh, the abstract Stokes' theorem would say that when you take the derivative of this form, the key point is you can prove that this is a is actually an exact form. It has the it has the shape d of theta, where theta is a one form, and explicitly uh, theta <laughs> ends up uh, being uh, you can uh, one way of saying it would be that in terms of the if you wanted to say what are the components of of this uh, one form you take the uh, you take the uh, area form and you contract it with uh, the divergence of the, uh, if the change in the metric is called H, take the divergence here and then, <coughs> um, sorry. All right, so there's some explicit expression that you can make. There's a particular vector field that you can write down uh, out of the change of the metric. And if you contract that with uh, the uh, two form to get, this is really just rotate this vector field by, by, by 90 degrees and think of the corresponding thing as a one form. It turns out that the change in, the, in this integrand is D of an explicit one form. And then the punchline is Stokes' theorem says the integral of d theta over a compact manifold is zero because the boundary is empty. All right, so uh, one thing you could, you could do is to show that if you have two different metrics, you can join them by a, a, a path of metrics. As you differentiate the integral along the path, you could think of that as integrating the derivative of the integrand 
the derivative of the integrand is an exact form, so it has integral zero, and you find out that before and after for two different metrics, the integral of the of the Gauss curvature with respect to the area form of that metric is actually metric independent. So once you've proved that theorem, it, it therefore uh, therefore suffices to check uh, the Gauss-Binet theorem for for one metric. All right. So uh, rather than taking just you know. You, in principle, you have lots of strange Riemannian metrics on a, on a compact surface without boundary. Um, you might get one by um, uh, embedding the surface in a 3000 dimensional Euclidean space and, and restricting uh, the, uh, the notion of lengths of tangent vectors, or you could, uh, you could do something which uh, is not so obviously, it turns out the, by a theorem of Nash, uh, Riemannian metrics on compact manifolds can always be uh, realized by embedding your manifold in a very high dimensional U Euclidean space. It's usually, it's a kind of useless theorem, interesting theorem though. Uh, but the point is you could take some very strange metric that might not come from an embedding in R3, but the lemma says, well, the, the Gauss-Binet integral has to be the same as if it was embedded in R3, just Take a one parameter family of metrics where one of the metrics is uh, embedded in R3. Finally, what you now do is you now look at the Gauss map. So I, I described the, the importance of the Gauss map. Sorry. Um, So we said that there was this important map. If M is sitting in R3, then you have this map called the Gauss map, which I call gamma, to the two sphere. And uh, what? Uh, let's think of the unit of this unit uh, two sphere as having uh, uh, area form alpha. The alpha is the usual area form. What, um, <laughs> pardon me. So the punchline is that you can show that the Gauss, <clears throat> so for, for your given metric that's in, induced on, on M, that the Gauss curvature times the area form of G. So this is the, this is the Gauss curvature this is the area form of G. This is the same dead on the nose as pullback via the Gauss map, the area form alpha. In fact, the way I defined uh, the, the Gauss curvature makes this almost uh, obvious because I defined the Gauss curvature as being the determinant of the derivative of the Gauss map. And here, when you pull back a two form, what you're, you're really doing is you're multiplying by the derivative of the, the determinant of the derivative of the map. This ends up then saying that, uh, so what you need is that there's a more general fact about integrating uh, differential forms on compact manifolds. What happens is that uh, this ends up saying that the integral of K omega is therefore equal to the integral of alpha on the two sphere. Oops. Times an integer called the degree of the map gamma. Now, uh, this is already very helpful because this expression is uh, four pi. And uh, this is. Uh, uh, therefore, going to tell us that the uh, is that the integral of uh, 
the, the integral of uh, the Gauss curvature is definitely some integer uh, times four pi. What is this notion of degree? What you're actually doing is that you have a map to the two sphere, you have a map to, uh, and then you, so you, you have M is somehow mapping to the two sphere. What, the degree can be described as take a generic point in the two sphere, count its pre-images, uh, with signs depending upon whether the map is reversing or preserving uh, the orientation near uh, near that, that that point near near those preimages. So there is a there is a number called the degree, which is just a, a, a signed count of points. It's definitely an integer. On the other hand, uh, the so this does not quite finish the proof. So I'm I'll I, I've been talking long enough. I'll stop the. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll I'll stop the uh, uh, presentation now. But the claim is that in fact the degree of gamma can be shown always to be equal to the Euler characteristic over two, and the Euler characteristic for for an oriented surface, remember, was two minus two g. So that's always. Uh, th that's always even. And dividing by two, I would get one minus the genus. All right. So, uh, so there's some some good geometry. You might think about why is it that um, the uh, that the degree of this map is in fact uh, half of the Euler characteristic, and it has to do with uh, the fact that the Euler characteristic can also be gotten by counting uh, critical points of a Morse function and uh, and uh, there is a, a, a direct link, link between uh, taking the count, uh, counting the pre-images of a direction and asking instead, if, if I took a height function uh, from on Euclidean space restricted to my, uh, to my surface, uh, how, many, at how many places is, its, uh, is the tangent space of, of this surface horizontal? All right, so there's a lot going on there, uh, more than I could possibly uh, do justice to in a single lecture. But I hope that um, uh, some of you will, will realize that uh, even in this fairly simple statement, I mean, it's, it's a very surprising statement that was discovered by Gauss in the, in the 1800s, um, uh, first half of the 1800s, that uh, that the integral of the Gauss curvature was always a uh, was always the Euler characteristic of the surface times two pi. And there are many uh, uh, very good ways of proving this that are very different. Uh, if you if you go on to graduate school and take a good uh, differential geometry course, you will probably end up seeing um, uh, several different uh, uh, proofs of the gauss benet theorem. Um, <clears throat> to, uh, to, to finish my lecture, um, let me now say just a few things about uh, 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 Riemannian geometry at Stony Brook. So uh, you may not be aware of this, but uh, Stony Brook is uh, uh, world famous as a center for Riemannian geometry, and particularly in the uh, the, the period from uh, let's say the the the, the period from uh, around uh, 1975 till about 2000, Stony Brook was uh, probably the largest department uh, in the world where serious research in Riemannian geometry was going on. It was a very large research group with uh, extremely major contributions to the relationship between curvature and topology. We're still, I think, uh, a very, uh, we're still a leading department in this field. So if you are, uh, are, are interested in uh, this subject, I hope that uh, you might look into the possibility of eventually uh, at least auditing a, uh, a graduate course in, uh, in Riemannian geometry. Uh, there's a lot to learn and there are lots of people in this department that can teach you very interesting things in the subject. So perhaps I should stop there unless there are questions. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Lebrun. Um, let's thank Professor Lebrun virtually or 
you know, you have a good clap feature. 